Okay, well, here we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, Bird, Safe's Maine, Bird Safe Maine's Fall 2023 webinar. Is that what year it is? Um, it's great to be with you as we finish out our third full year of um, surveying. Uh, we are really excited for the fall. The fall is uh, really where a lot of the uh, important data comes. We we get a lot more birds in the fall than the spring. Uh, there's a lot of action on the street. It's an important time to be out there. And it's already happening. We are already getting uh, lots of strikes in. Migration, as, as folks know, is already underway. Um, and so the time is now to continue the research into bird strikes. Um, let me introduce some of my colleagues here before we get going. Um, to my left on the thing here uh, is Dr. Chris Marr from uh, the University of Southern Maine. Hey, Chris. Good morning. Oh, no, now it is actually officially afternoon. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the returners and welcome to the new people. And below me on the screen here is uh, our delightful friend, Katie Netland. She is our um, AmeriCorps GP COG, which stands for Greater Portland Council of Governments Fellow. We have had her with us for 11 months now. Um, she uh, came in for a, a year long term and she will be departing our official role um, here right in the middle of our fall survey at the end of September. Uh, but uh, it's been great having her so far. And um, Hey, Katie. Hey. You may anyone in the Bangor area may have seen her on the news recently. I was on the news recently. Nick, I am here, but don't see anyone but you. That's right. Uh, so, Jim, so in this webinar format, we're just keeping it to the three presenters today. Um, I see Jim in the chat. So it's just uh, just the three cameras on, but there's attendees uh, um, listening at home. So um, for that's part of the sort of uh, technical spiel I'll give for folks. Uh, attending this webinar, if you want to ask questions, um, it's a small crew, so not a big deal. Um, but you can put them in the Q and A box down below. Um, those are seen just by the three panelists here, or you can put them in the ch in the chat where everyone is typing, which can be seen by everybody. Um, so that's just the format of the of the thing today. So let's get to business. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, um, an intro of this issue and what we do, who we are. Um, I will turn it over to Chris then to talk a little bit about some of the, the data we've collected so far. And then we'll talk a little bit about what the volunteering in Portland is. Um, at that point, if there are people who are, who are not interested in doing the actual Portland route, um, you can drop off or, or continue if you want to. But um, it'll become more specific information for folks who want to help out with our uh, uh, Portland route walking. And Katie, at that point, will, will give you some info about how to take some good photos. So without further ado, let me go ahead and do that right now. And hopefully everybody can see that. All right. Well, we are Bird Safe Maine. Um, this is a collaborative project between uh, my organization, Maine Audubon, uh, PSA, which is the Portland Society for Architecture, and I'm sure that's the outdated logo. Um, Addie will be disappointed. Um, USM, University of Southern Maine, and then Avian Haven, though, will go up there. Uh, we are four groups who have come together to um, organize Bird Safe Maine. And what we do is understand this. This is a bird that has collided with a glass window and is now dead on the sidewalk. This is a, um, this was a scarlet tanager. Um, the whole environmental community and architectural community is waking up to the understanding of how, just how big a problem this is, birds colliding with glass windows. Um, the numbers, if you look at them, are, are, are fairly staggering. Um, this is a slide from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which um, collects information from studies about human-caused bird mortality. Um, you can see there at the top that bird building glass collisions, building glass collisions, um, are estimated to kill between 365 million and 988 million birds per year in the United States. So that is, at its most conservative estimate, a million birds per day dying in the United States after colliding with glass. 
Uh, and you can sort of compare that to some other causes of mortality down below. You know, a lot of people get concerned about wind turbines, um, 140,000 there. So, you know, the, um, the number of birds that have died this morning um, from colliding with windows is greater than the entire year long number of, of wind turbines. Um, um, of course, there are uh, uh, only a few uh, factors that may um, sort of outpace building glass, cats being one of them. Um, but you can see that building glass collisions is now being recognized as one of the leading uh, causes of bird mortality in the entire country. This happens, sort of the problem peaks when birds are on the move. Um, this is a year long problem as many of us studying it know, but it definitely peaks um, as birds are on the move, mostly because um, they uh, ha have more opportunities to encounter buildings and glass. Um, we are on the cusp of fall migration. Fall migration is the biggest bird movement time of the year. Um, you can see on this map here in the spring, about three and a half billion birds come up from uh, part South Mexico, wintering areas in the Caribbean, South America. Um, they move through the country to about two and a half billion of them move through Maine or near Maine on their way north. They all come to have babies, right? So their populations grow in the summer. And then in the fall, they all start heading south. And so right about now, we there are billions of birds that are on the move. Um, there are even more birds in the country that may uh, in, be doing localized movements or seasonal movements, um, uh, latitudinal movements, um, altitudinal movements. And so this 4 billion birds doesn't even uh, take into account the full movement of birds. So there's a lot of birds in the move. And as they move, they encounter things which they hadn't encountered before, you know, before humans were around and built all the things we built. Um, glass is not something that birds are used to dealing with. Um, but now it is a major uh, sort of uh, aspect of the landscape. Um, this glass building here um, is uh, something that is very confusing to a bird, right? Um, this is not a natural part of the landscape, not naturally something I have to deal with, but it's very confusing. Um, glass uh, plays a number of tricks on birds. Uh, one of the most common is that it's reflective, right? So here is a big glass building to a bird used to flying through the sky, this just looks like the sky, right? And so this, um, uh, a bird will simply just be flying through the sky and could encounter a building like this, not having any way to prepare itself, no way to understand what, what this threat is and, uh, and collide. Um, glass reflects the sky, it also reflects habitat. Uh, the majority of bird strikes are actually um, lower to the ground in the first three levels of uh, three floors of a building. Um, because typically what birds are doing is not flying high through the sky, um, but flying low uh, from, from the safety to safety of, of different vegetation or looking for food. And so uh, where vegetation is reflected in, a, in glass, um, that can become very dangerous for birds as they think they're moving um, to safety, rather. Um, so glass is reflective, but it's also transparent. Um, glass can become um, invisible at certain times of the day. Uh, I, I was introduced to this work when I lived in Washington, D.C. in the early 2000, uh, 2010s. Um, we uh, did a similar program down there. We walked a route through, through D.C. looking for uh, birds that had struck buildings during migration. Um, this building one was, was one of our uh, biggest culprits then. This is the Thurgood Marshall um, Judiciary Building near Union Station. Um, this build, this uh, sort of two stone buildings connected by a big glass atrium, which during the day uh, reflects the sky and the sunset, but at night is lit from within um, to highlight these big bamboo um, growths in the middle. Um, and the glass here is just simply invisible. You know, when lit with, from within, this, this vegetation is um, sort of a beacon to birds migrating through and they would attempt to uh, make it in and, and collide with the glass. So building glass um, is um, just a trick that plays, uh, that it can be deadly to, to millions of birds a year. Lights are a factor as well. Um, lights can attract insects, which attract birds who want to feed on them. Um, lights can also sort of confuse birds as they're migrating, and then uh, they work to sort of uh, to connect other migrants into them. This is the tribute in light 
um, uh, on the September 11th, um, the, the site of the Twin Towers, where um, at that time every year they they beam these very bright lights up into the sky. Um, September 11th is is right at the height of fall migration, and you can see here reflected in these lights a, a number of birds that have been attracted to the lights. Um, there are some studies showing just how attractive they are, where, where thousands of birds um, uh, come into these lights when they are turned on um, on September 11th. Um, lights, the, the role of lighting and glass is, is fairly complicated. Um, during our years of walking on this project and, and you know, where the science is going, um, glass itself, uh, you know, certainly we want to work to reduce our light loss. There are a number of benefits we gain um, from, you know, covering lights and not shooting them up into the sky. Um, but glass is really the problem. It's, it's, more, it's, a, it's a day uh, and night problem, uh, potentially. Um, and so glass is our major focus here. The good thing about this problem is that there are lots of solutions, right? There are lots of ways that we can work to make better buildings that are just as light and airy, uh, but that don't um, uh, have the reflective dangers of, uh, you know, a big mirrored glass building. Um, these are just a couple of sort of fancy examples of buildings in New York City that have um, different treatments on their glass. Um, the, the building on the left there has a mixture of uh, frosted and fritted glass. Um, which even though it's just a simple sort of all glass building, um, like you may see, um, had, uses a number of techniques to reduce its threat to birds. Um, at last count, I had heard uh, from the New York City folks who monitor uh, this building that they had never recorded a bird strike there. Uh, the building on the right um, is covered in a sort of screen mesh. Um, this is a really interesting technique where you can still get all the light uh, and benefits from having all glass, but you also get a number of privacy benefits, a number of um, uh, heat loss benefits, uh, and plus it just looks cool uh, on this building. Um, there are other techniques too. This is the Javits Center in New York. So this is the same building that I showed here. Um, this building, a big convention center, was for many years uh, considered the, the deadliest bird building to, to birds uh, in the country. This building has a number of you know, threats. It's all glass. It has a high level of reflection. It has a high level of, um, uh, it, you know, it's lit from within at night. It also has a number of pass-through areas. So an area where you could, where a bird can see, uh, look through two windows, basically look through this window, look through the back window and then see trees or, or places on the other side. That's highly dangerous because a bird can just think it can fly through the, to the sides. So this building was, um, for many years, um, you know, considered the most dangerous to birds. They went went through a major retrofit, where they installed these um, glass, you know, glass with these fritted dots on them. Um, this fritted material doesn't look like much at all uh, to a human eye. So this picture on the right is looking out through the fritted glass, and you you know you can't see anything there. Um, but to a bird, they are able to detect these and know that this is a solid object and not uh, a glass window. It also cuts the reflection. Um, and so this building was able to reduce its danger by about 90% um, after this retrofit. There are a number of other products on the market and more and more every day, including um, etched glass and, and other fritted glass. Um, you know, this traditionally is, uh, you know, bird safety is, is a new issue for architects and builders. Um, this is something that is not really taught in architecture schools yet, um, but is something that um, um, there we are working with lots of them on as we sort of understand the scope of this problem. Um, we are very lucky to have our partners at PSA, Portland Society for Architecture, who um, have connected us to um, lots and lots of architects and designers um, uh, in, Port in Portland and around Maine. Uh, many of them you know, willing and 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 uh, wanting to understand what the you know what's going on here and what they can do about it, um, and a lot I will say of that um, interest and demand is driven by people like us, uh, driven by clients who now understand um, that they don't want to see dead birds, uh, you know, outside their windows, by employees who don't want to work in a building where uh, where birds are flying into their windows all the time when trying to get stuff done. Um, and a growing understanding among the public, uh, in large part through the work, the education that, that we've done, 
about what causes collisions. What is a dangerous building um, and what's a non-dangerous building? Um, and so this is our uh, third, end of our third year of official um, surveying, uh, unless I'm wrong. And this is the beginning of our fourth year, right, Chris? We start in the spring and the fall. Um, we started in the fall. So okay. we this have end. completed three, uh, three full cycles. That's right. So this is the start of our fourth cycle. Right. Um, and we've been getting the word out. And so um, part of what this volunteering is done is doing, part of what we're asking you to do is, um, you know, we're using this data to really expand our education about what the problem is. And guess what? It's, it's really having an effect on uh, building owners. Um, case in point is the new L.L. Bean headquarters that's going up in Freeport. Um, you know, this was built at a time uh, or, or designed at a time when we uh, we were just getting started here at Birdsafe, Maine and didn't have our education in place like we do now. Uh, there, there's a lot of glass on the, the woods facing side of that building and they started having strikes. You know, people were moving into the building and employees were seeing strikes. And so they came back to us and said, you know, we want to do something about it. Uh, because of our collaboration, uh, L. Bean installed what we believe is the largest retrofit in New England. So the largest sort of treatment of glass um, in New England, about 19,000 square feet um, to help reduce their, uh, their danger. It's great. Uh, we are making some other policy uh, strides as well. So we're really proud of a couple issues here. One is this bill. Um, as of this spring, uh, Maine is just one of four states that has taken statewide action on uh, bird safe, the bird safe issue. Um, we passed this bill, LD 670, to um, uh, it was called an act to protect birds and wildlife in the construction and maintenance of public buildings. Uh, what we're going to be doing throughout this year and in the fall and for another year is to work to develop guidelines that can be um, used in, in public buildings. Uh, we're one of the few states that has anything like that. Uh, and we're really proud to have, you know, taken this step to continue the education of, um, you know, builders and architects uh, around the state. And we are also on the cusp of passing this, which is a ordinance in the state of Portland. Um, the way a lot of the policy responses to this issue are going now are municipal ordinances, which uh, require new buildings to be built with a certain bird safe standard. Um, this is, uh, unlike the, the, the statewide bill we passed, these are not sort of voluntary guidelines. This would be required um, as part of um, getting a building approved. Um, and we are, you know, we have really high hopes for, for getting this through the council this fall. Um, and as, you know, in order to do that, we need the continued support of our volunteers to remind people that this is a problem in Portland. This is happening. Um, and so uh, we have some uh, a, a city council meeting coming up on September 13th, uh, where hopefully we'll, we'll get some subcommittee um, approval and, and move on from there. Um, so, you know, we have policy, uh, we've started for three years, you know, developing the data, pulling that data together, um, and we are using it to achieve policy ends that we're very excited about. Um, before I turn it over to Chris, I'll just talk a little about, you know, what this is we do. Uh, this, first of all, this is for statewide folks. So there's two basically parts of our, our monitoring. One is a, a route that we have volunteers walk every morning in Portland to find birds on the street. The other is just folks living anywhere in Maine. If you find a bird anywhere in your back porch at, you know, downtown somewhere, um, let us know. So if you are one of those folks who doesn't live in Portland or is not interested in the, the actual route walking volunteering, um, this slide is for you. Um, if you find a dead bird anywhere, it doesn't need to be in the fall. Um, it can be anywhere, anytime. Um, take a picture of it, please, and send it to us. Uh, if you send it to that birdstrike at mainaudubon.org email address, we will identify the bird and we will, we will file it away in our system um, to, uh, to help with our advocacy. Uh, if it's an injured bird, we partner with Avian Haven. There's a number there that you can call if you'd like to get, get assistance. Um, and that's what we ask you to do. Simple as that. Just um, take a picture of the bird, take an evocative one if you can. And Katie will tell you in a few minutes uh, some information about taking evocative pictures um, and, uh, and let us know. The other part is this. I mean, a lot of these pictures were taken 
during the pandemic. Um, so we're having, we have masks on all the time, but um, is walking the streets of Portland. Um, this is me crouching by a, uh, a common yellow throat that had struck uh, the Wex building on Commercial Street down there. Um, this, is what, uh, this is what we do. We, uh, we walk around the streets uh, and we walk this, the same route uh, every day um, to trying to figure out which buildings birds are striking against, what species, uh, what numbers, uh, anything we can about, about the problem in Portland. Um, and guess what? We, we find a lot. Um, here are the two Collenberg girls, uh, famous volunteers of ours, um, with some of the birds they found uh, one fall that appears to be a white-throated sparrow in a northern parilla there. Uh, but we find all kinds of birds. We found hundreds and hundreds over our time. Um, some are dead, like this white-throated sparrow and the Swainson's uh, thrush and the, the Savannah sparrow. Um, some are alive and stunned, like the common yellow throat in the hand there. Um, we take photos and re take recordings of, of each and every one. Um, I'll talk a little bit more in detail in, in a minute. Um, um, just quickly, well, maybe I'll turn it over to Chris now and uh, we'll get to the um, get to the rest of it in a minute. Okay. Um, and actually, let me just, um, just pause and answer this question really quickly. Is there material on the subject that can be provided for people refurbishing buildings? Yes. Um, um, it, it's difficult. Um, we have had success in retrofits. The, the difficulty with, with retrofitting buildings, especially in Portland, is it's very expensive to do. Um, and so uh, not every building can immediately sort of jump and, and retrofit. But uh, I think Katie has some exciting news coming up uh, a little bit later. I'll let you just talk about that if you want to, uh, about an exciting retrofit we're working on in Portland um, that we're excited to see this fall. Um, but now let me turn it over to uh, Chris, to um, this building has FEMA money, interesting. Let's talk later. Um, let's turn it over to Chris to talk to you about uh, our, what we've learned so far in the uh, couple of seasons we've been doing this. Okay, thanks. Do you have the ability to share, Chris? Um, it looks like it, yes. Okay. Here we go. All right, and uh, let me just open, okay. So I'm just going to, um, some of you, especially for some of the um, returning group here, you might just be interested to kind of see what your data, um, where your data have been going and, and how it's helping us figure, um, affect some of those policy changes. Um, so this is just, um, I'm, and for now, this is just showing you the fall data since we're going into fall. Um, spring data um, look a little different, but um, but generally, like Nick said, falls are big time. And you can see that, you know, even right from the get go, we start finding birds in early um, September, but the real peak comes in um, late September, um, early October, which is about when the big pulse of, of migrants comes through the area. And you see that it's fairly consistent, um, has been fairly consistent for the last two years um, as to when we find birds. And um, when we find birds as, oops, let's see here, come on. All right, there we go. Um, they We have these three different categories, like Nick mentioned. So some of the birds are dead, some are stunned, and some of them um, hit the buildings and then just bounce off. They, um, many of them just kind of fly away. And so those we designate as strikes. And this is showing um, the different, um, the, the six different seasons that we have now. And one of the trends that you'll see um, well, first of all, I guess, is that most of the birds we find are dead. Out of all the birds we see, about 64% of all the birds we find are dead. But we do find about 40% of the birds that are just stunned. And we'll talk more about what to do, what we do with those birds um, a little bit later. Um, and then about 10% of the birds um, are just strikes and then they, they fly off. But, but the other thing that you might notice on this graph um, and one of the reasons why we keep doing this every year um, is that the the um, the data the bars are trending upward. You see that every year, um, especially in the fall, our numbers have gone way up, and that's not strictly due to the fact that we have more people right out on the streets. Because um, particularly in twenty one and twenty two, we had the same number of groups walking the route, um, basically two pairs um, walking in opposite directions. Um, but the reason we think is probably more that we have new buildings coming online that are posing a threat to birds. Um, you see that that trend has also gone up somewhat in spring. 
Um, but you'd also notice that there's a lot fewer birds that hit in the spring compared to the fall, which just goes back to the fact that there are just more birds moving in the fall. And so we're going to see more birds striking. Um, so what's going to be interesting this year is A, to see if, if this trend continues, but especially because, as Nick alluded to, we have some kind of exciting um, retrofit news that could be important for, well, will be important for us to monitor this year and see how it's going to affect our data going forward. All right, so with that in mind, all right, so who hits, which birds hit? And so in this graph, you can see that there's a lot of different um, families of birds that hit. We find big birds, even gulls, um, and doves and pigeons and woodpeckers striking windows. But the vast majority of the birds are passerines or songbirds. And of those, the vast, vast majority are um, sparrows and warblers. Um, so collectively, about two thirds of all the birds that strike are in those two families. And if we drill down a little bit more and just look at the warblers, it's those common yellow throats, which you've already seen a couple pictures of. Um, this picture that I put in here actually had two birds um, that were probably migrating together and collided um, at pretty much the same time. But, um, and you see that, again, most of the birds that we find, uh, the warblers um, are dead, but there are some that just gets done. But common yellow throats make up about 41% of all the warblers that we find. And that's partly because of where yellow throats like to hang out. Um, low down. These are kind of like these birds like to be in shrubs and things like that. And a lot of the strikes we see do happen close to ground level. Um, if we look at the, the sparrows, um, white-throated sparrows are really vulnerable. And, and we find this has been reported for other in other studies as well. Um, many, about over half of the warblers that we find are white throats. And again, they're, you know, sparrows, they like to be close to the ground and probably fly up and, and um, strike the windows. You also notice that um, in this unknown category, most of those are strikes. Um, we have not I've been able to identify. And that's because, you know, you see a bird hit and it flies off and you go sparrow and can't figure out what kind of sparrow it is because sparrows can be tricky even on a good day. Um, all right. All right, so now where have we been finding birds? We find birds lots of different places along our route. So our route's about two miles long that we walk and there are many, many different buildings um, that have contributed to the data set over the years. Um, but you notice that there are th um, a few buildings that really stand out um, and um, that have our, our um, well, that basically, um, are responsible for most of the collisions. And if we, again, zoom in a little bit more, there's about six buildings in particular that account for almost two thirds of all of the collisions that we see. Um, and I'll just real quickly um, give you those top three. Um, this is a new building that came online and was probably one of the reasons why we saw a big increase in um, most recently. This is um, the new building on Thames Street down kind of at the end of, um, of what used to be Commercial Street across from the Narrow Gauge Railroad in that area. And it has some of the key features that um, we know contribute to why, why birds hit. It's close to the water where the birds are probably coming in, you know, following the water during migration, and then they come in and land to rest during the day or, or even at night. And then, but there's also a nice habitat adjacent to the building, um, trees and shrubs and things for them to take refuge in. And there's a lot of glass. Um, our second place building is this one, um, which is on Commercial Street. It sits back from the water a little bit, but it's basically very close to the waterfront as well. And there's really nice habitat next to it too. So there are some very large trees and an alleyway, and the trees are, are probably attractive to the birds when they're coming in to rest um, during their migration. And then when they go to take off from the trees, they encounter this highly reflective surface and that they don't probably perceive as glass and hit it and fall down. And so this is kind of um, pretty lethal alleyway. And um, yeah, like I said, I'll save Katie to talk a little bit more uh, or Nick about um, what's going to be happening at this one, that this building that does have a lot of glass. And then right now, um, and, and these two buildings, this one on Commercial Street and this last one um, are very similar. They, right now. They are um, really responsible for the vast majority of our birds um, that we see hitting. And um, this one, again, is, is on the corner of Hancock Street. And I guess that's commercial or 
Thames. It's hard to say to write that that in. It's right on the waterfront. It's straight across the street from Ocean Gateway. It's the first building that we pretty much, a second building maybe that we check on our route. Um, it's got a courtyard in the back and, a sh and the alcove shape is also um, a way that birds get trapped in there. Um, there's nice habitat right across the street and in this courtyard for the birds. And um, there's just, again, a lot of glass, all the things that make these particularly problematic for birds. So with that, um, I will stop my part and stop sharing and turn it back over to Nick. Yeah, okay. Let me start sharing. This could be a little smoother. There we go. So uh, thank you, Chris. That was the route that we take. Um, or And here are those sort of highlight. Here's the route. So those buildings are all on the route around Portland. Um, how did we choose this? Um, and this is the route that we'll be doing every day. Um, you know, this is not, you know, we wanted to do a route that would take us by buildings that we thought were more dangerous, which is buildings um, that have a lot of glass. The science has shown repeatedly that, you know, the number one predictor for how dangerous a building is, is, is how much glass is on the facade. Um, we built this route because it takes us by a number of buildings that have a lot of glass, but also through a number of buildings that don't have very much glass or, you know, relatively. Uh, what we were hoping to do was, um, you know, test it out in practice. Um, are, are birds indeed dying more often against birds, uh, buildings that have glass or, and are they dying less often against buildings that don't have as much glass? Um, as you saw from Chris's presentation, you know, it, it, absolutely. Um, it, it's very clear to us now um, that the science that, that uh, you know, has been developed elsewhere in the country absolutely applies to Portland, where number one, birds are striking against buildings and number two, they are striking more often against uh, buildings that have a lot of glass. Um, but we need to continue our monitoring. Um, and so this is the route that we are asking folks to do. Um, and can you see my cursor, Chris? Like, can you see yes. that? Okay. So um, this is where we uh, typically start every morning. And this is where we're going to start our group walk. This is where we start. Every season, we start off with a group walk where everyone is invited to meet. And we all walk the route together um, so you can um, you know, feel it firsthand. Uh, we meet down here at Ocean Gateway. Um, so you all probably know this, this parking lot and building. It's that, uh, it's the ferry terminal that sort of juts out into the, um, or the, uh, the not the ferry terminal, but the um, cruise ship terminal um, uh, where people meet down there. It's a sort of low slung building that uh, has a lot of glass and, and um, is, a, is a bird strike uh, possibility. Uh, but there's lots of parking and it's a good place to meet. So we meet down here at Ocean Gateway. Um, the route then starts by going across to uh, what we know as the WEX building. Um, so this is the building that's one of our, uh, you know, the 20, 23% of all, it's the leading building and has been for a number of years uh, in conjunction with the, the Memic building. Um, so we start here, we go to Memic, we walk down to the Sun Life building. This was the number three building that Chris uh, mentioned here. Uh, we head up, we go down Forest Street, and we look the whole way. We don't just wait until we think we're at a place that there might be strikes. You're constantly sort of monitoring the sidewalk for birds. Um, you know, while Chris said that um, she's right that you know the majority of birds are found in a couple of places, we have found birds at I think over a hundred different locations along this route. Um, so birds can be anywhere. Sometimes they are found at, at places that don't appear to be a major you know threat area. Sometimes they appear just um, in low numbers at various other places. So as we walk, we're continually sort of looking on the sidewalk. And it's really, that's it. You know, you just, you simply look on the sidewalk. Um, you see them as, uh, you know, small lumps on the sidewalk. Sometimes they are, if they're injured, they may be, you know, huddled against a building or showing other signs of, of distress or uh, uncomfort. Um, those are good signs that they're, that that's a strike. We walk up here along 4th Street. We go up, we cross uh, Middle Street here all the way down. Um, we come all the way over here to the TD Bank Plaza. Um, this is a spot now, it's, it used to be, um, uh, uh, what was it? Now it's gonna be that taco building. It's that sort of odd almond shaped class building um, in the TD Bank courtyard. Um, we go across the street to One City Center. Uh, we walk up uh, to the library here. And we go down uh, over to Congress Street up to um, the, the Workout Anytime building. This is where we sort of turn 
And this is a 24 hour fitness building that is probably number four on the list of, of strikes. So you find a lot of birds in there and have, and have discussed them uh, with them about remediation issues. Uh, we go from there down to uh, the cross insurance arena um, and continue this. I'm looking at is this, um, it's actually a little different than the route that we do now. Yeah, you right? said TD Bank. You meant Canal Plaza before, Nick, not TD Bank, because then we come down to TD Bank Plaza after cross insurance. Okay. So we need to update this map a little bit um, because I think usually what we do now is come down here. Um, we go from cross insurance down Spring Street and then down here, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. So, and that's a TD Bank Plaza. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, so we need to update this map, and I apologize, this is correct, but, I, but I'm going to send around some materials um, next week, or uh, yeah, probably next early next week, and um, it'll have the updated maps on it. But generally, we walk down here, and then we come down uh, through the TD Bank Plaza. There's this big sort of beautiful courtyard here uh, with a lot of vegetation. What, what you find is you, when you do this walk is that areas of vegetation in Portland are just bird magnets. And so on days of heavy migration, um, whatever trees, you know, they may not look like much, but whatever sort of small parks and trees you find are full of birds. And there's sort of a little unofficial park down here, the TD Bank Plaza, where there's lots of bird activity and consequently the potential for, for lots of strikes. So we come down through there and then down to the Memic building here. Um, the Memic building, including the, the alley behind Memic, is um, one of the leading areas for bird strikes. And I, I guess I'll just spill the beans. Sorry, Katie. Um, we have been working with, with Mimic for a number of years about potential mediation back there. Um, it's a very expensive uh, a process, but um, Katie learned as she was doing a sort of route preview the other day that they are indeed go moving forward with some decals uh, and, uh, on the windows back there. So we're very excited about that um, and are eager to see how it is installed through the year and, and what impacts it might have. So that's great news. Um, so we uh, typically go from Mimic. Uh, we don't actually usually go down to Baxter Place anymore. Um, we, we haven't found many birds down there and we have other volunteers who sometimes come that way. Uh, but generally we um, go from Mimic um, uh, back down 4th Street past um, this big glass parking garage and some other garages um, and then work our way back on um, Commercial Street, 10th Street, back to Ocean Gateway. Um, that's typically how the route goes. I, I will talk in a little bit about, you know, once we sign up and we have a number of volunteers, what we can do with the route in terms of mixing it up or starting at different places. Um, but that's generally how the route goes through the city. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more um, towards the end here about how the route goes, but I want to turn it over to Katie now to talk about the most important thing you can do on the route, which is taking the photos. Or even if you're not walking the route, I guess. Right. Nick, can I can I control the slides myself or? I don't think so. If that's okay, um, I, I don't. Uh, can there's no way to do that, right? No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, you can just start it. Okay, so the three things we're looking for in photos, and sometimes this isn't always possible because um, frequently birds, especially if they're stunned. Um, can be difficult to get the perfect picture of and any picture is better than no picture. That's definitely worth saying. Um, we're looking for them to be clear, identifiable and ideally evocative as well because we do use these um, in uh, any kind of press that we participate in. So this is an example of something that's not that great. Um, as you can see, it's from pretty far away um, you can see the building, but you can't really see the bird. And as often these photos are being sent to us to identify it, it's um, the best when we can actually really see the bird. But we are looking for um, photos of it near the building and then close up photos of the bird itself. So both are great, um, but this isn't a great example. The next one is a, is a good example of what um, a good picture is. Um, this is both clear and identifiable. This is a female uh, common yellow throat. You can see the belly, you can see the throat, um, you can see the side. Ideally, you would have a side, a top, and a bottom photo just to make it super clear. Um, yeah, you can keep going. 
This is a good way to show the building, um, show the bird, make it evocative and also make it identifiable. Um, as you can see, our wonderful volunteers uh, has gloves on when handling the birds. That's recommended. If you're going to pick up the birds um, and move them anywhere, gloves are generally recommended. Um, or if you do pick it up, don't like touch your face and wash your hands after. This one's um, a tricky one. I'm sure it was difficult lighting because we do monitor early in the morning, but sometimes flash can help with the lighting um, and really holding that camera steady or even picking the bird up because this one is uh, hard to identify. These are both great. Um, ideally, these would be paired with images that also show the back um, and heads of the bird because that can frequently be really useful for identification. Um, a good reason for that that I can point out is the one on the right is actually a juvenile male common yellow throat, um, which you can tell because there's some black feathering on the face. But from, you know, like a bottom angle that might just look like a female common yellow throat and understanding sex and age of the birds is helpful for us in determining whether those are factors contributing to higher uh, collision rates for them. One on the left is awesome too. Really easy to identify that bird for us. Um, good clear image. Um, the one to the right is evocative in a way, but it's difficult to identify. So this would be okay as long as it's paired with um, an image that someone on our side can be identifying the bird. Cool. That's all we have. For there we part. go. Thanks, Katie. Um, yeah. If the bird is stunned, my last recommendation is. Um, like this picture here, it, it is good to get an evocative picture of them. Obviously, be careful that you're not stressing the bird out necessarily. Sometimes those pictures aren't going to be perfect, but um, you want to give them as good a chance to recover as possible. So that's my last thought. Thanks, Katie. Yeah. So, yeah, photos are really important here. This photos are, you know, what changes this, especially for decision makers and builders. Um, from something theoretical to something real. Um, you know, nobody wants to be responsible for killing birds. Um, and the truth of the matter is that uh, although, you know, lots and lots of birds strike buildings, this is, this is a fairly easy problem to not notice. Um, you know, birds are eaten by gulls. Birds are eaten by rodents uh, when they're on the sidewalk. And so they don't last very long. And so it's easy not to know the scope of this problem. I mean, that's our job is to let people know that this actually is indeed a problem and it's happening in Portland at these very specific buildings. So that's why taking a, taking photos um, is so helpful. Plus, there's a scientific element, of course, of helping us understand exactly what species are hitting um, and, you know, what ages and, and timings. So how do we do it? How does it actually happen? So the good news is in the fall, it happens a little later in the, in the day than the spring. Um, typically, we time our route um, to begin at dawn um, because birds migrate at night. During the day, they come out of the skies as they uh, you know, seek shelter and safety for the day. And then they wait for nightfall before they migrate again. Um, so in the, at dawn, when they're coming out of the skies, um, you know, they don't really know where they are. They come down wherever they are. And if that's in a city, then they have to figure out how to navigate the city and find safety. And so that's when they're sort of most susceptible to strikes. So we start uh, at dawn, but unlike in the spring when dawn is like 5 a.m., um, dawn in the fall is a little later. So we start our walks at 6.30 a.m. in the fall, and we actually can go even later than that um, as it, we get into October. Um, we start, as I said, at the Ocean Gateway building. Um, there's typically plenty of places to park um, early in the morning down there. Um, you can bring whatever you'd like. Um, Typically, you know, the, the main goal here is, is comfort. So bring some shoes you can walk in. The route is about two miles. Um, and usually about, to, you know, takes an hour or so. Um, and so um, being comfortable walking is uh, extremely important here. Um, and so bring comfortable shoes, wear the clothing you need to, to, to go. Um, one thing we don't ask, we don't require, is that if you find a dead bird that you keep it or hold on to it. We actually, um, we, we actually don't need um, the birds. Um, at one, one or two seasons there, we had a, a volunteer who was collecting birds for a, for a parasite study. 
um, but we no longer sort of need the carcasses. And so you don't need to collect birds. We ask you to, you know, move them out of the way. Um, if, if you feel comfortable doing that, picking them up and placing them either under a bush or, or um, just sort of uh, not right on the sidewalk anymore. Um, but you don't need to, to hold on to the bird. Um, so you don't actually need Ziploc bags or, or things like that. Um, you can carry paper bags with you. Paper bag can be used if you're looking to um, rehabilitate a bird. Um, we sort of leave it up to volunteers about what they want to do with injured birds. Um, a bird that has been injured in a strike, the truth is that there's, um, well, there, there's a debate about how effective rehabil rehabilitation is. Um, when a bird strikes, I mean, these are tiny, very light creatures, um, and they are subjected to sometimes internal injuries that can be very hard for uh, to fix. Um, they can die quickly, and sometimes the process of handling them and, and getting them to safety um, can just simply add to the danger. Um, but we do partner with Avian Haven. They have volunteers in Portland who uh, are willing to come and, and help bring a bird to a rehabilitator if that's what you'd like. Um, typically, what we try to do with, with stunned birds um, is we move them uh, out of the way. So the, the process of moving a bird can be very difficult. If a bird is actively, actively sort of moving away from you, if you approach it, then just simply stop and, and let the bird uh, re recover on its own. Um, chasing the bird uh, it, um, is more dangerous than, than leaving it be. Um, but but often birds uh, will not, you know, will be in a state where they are not trying to evade you. Uh, if that case, you can carefully pick them up. And what I do is move them to a bush or a tree um, somewhere not on the ground where they have a better chance of, you know, not being taken by a, uh, a cat or not being stepped on or something uh, and give them a chance to recover. So you, you have some opportunities um, and options there. Um, but please take pictures. Um, uh, we um, uh, we really use those pictures, as Katie mentioned. Um, when you're done for the day, um, we have a little bit uh, of a new system this year, uh, where uh, the the group leader will will be responsible for emailing photos and information um, to to us. But you um, take note of what time you found the bird, what the, what the address you found it at. Um, if you like to try to identify it, that's great. But um, but Katie and I and Chris can identify the bird, uh, and any other notes that you think would be relevant. Uh, An email. Um, when you're done, first of all, the best part of it being the fall is that the the coffee shops are open. In the spring, you're, it's you're like you're just you drive home before you can get coffee. Um, but there's um, uh, plenty of things to eat and drink in Portland. Congratulate yourself for, for doing a good deed. You have the whole day ahead of you. You're up and you've got, taken, got your exercise. Um, you want to email the photos you found. Um, on here, it says uh, my address and Chris's address. Um, I should put just the bird strike uh, address on there. Um, and I'll send this information tomorrow. Um, and how do we begin? Um, the group walk is on September 6th. Um, this is a really fun actually event, we get a whole bunch of people out on the street. Uh, we walk around together looking for birds. Um, we, we generally find birds every every group walk. I don't think I've done a fall group walk, especially where I haven't found a bird. Um, spring's a little different, but um, so it'll, you, you can see what happens when you, when you find a bird. Um, in part of a packet, I'll be sending volunteers next week. There'll be a waiver that we, we ask volunteers to sign. Um, and then um, you can put your name into the spreadsheet. And I'll be putting that spreadsheet in the chat just now, um, and you'll see how the sign-up process works. So that is that. Let me get the um, spreadsheet right here. And we will say that, um, I don't think, Nick, you haven't mentioned anything about rain yet, have you? Oh, uh, no, go ahead. Yeah, so, I mean, if it's it's totally up to the volunteers if they want to walk. Most of our volunteers are super dedicated and they still go out regardless of the weather. However, um, you know, if it's really raining hard, we don't expect much bird activity. Um, and so it's not essential that you go out um, even when it's raining. Sometimes if it's a light rain or mist, you know, we get the fog around here, um, you know, we, we will still go out. Um, the other thing, Nick, did you want to mention about the BirdCast website? Sure. Um, there is a website, I'll get it right now, um, from Cornell, um, which is uh, incredibly accurate 
uh, and intriguing, there it is right there, at forecasting bird migration. So every night they uh, analyze the, the wind directions and the weather patterns and you know typical species movements. Um, and they uh, can, can give an estimate of what's gonna happen that night. And so you as a volunteer can look and see like, oh my goodness, all these birds are moving tonight. Um, uh, this is what I might see before. Um, yeah, Jim, we as a group try to walk every day. Volunteers can do whatever they want. That could be, you know, typically what, what I do is once a week um, because of the, the amount of volunteers we have. Um, if folks want to go more than once a week, that's awesome. If you want to do once or twice a fall, that's fine too. If you, whatever works for schedules. Um, if you, you know, are going on vacation and aren't around, totally fine. You know, we'll figure it out. Um, we are, are lucky to um, have a, a pretty good volunteer turnout uh, after a couple of years of this. And so it should be fine. Um, check out that. Um, yeah, we're doing a different thing for the, um, for the contact uh, list, sorry. Um, but, but check out this sheet here. Um, the sheet, uh, well, you have all the dates um, and it'll uh, let you um, pick what you want. Um, yeah, were we gonna put the contact list on the same sheet? Yeah, we were. We haven't, maybe we should do a different sheet. What did we decide to do, Katie, with the uh, contact sheet? We used to have it on a different I separated tab. People it. had difficulty using the I tabs. separated it. Okay. Into, into two different into like a different thing in the in the drive so people could access it easier okay let me get that for you right now yep so and this is the con the volunteer contact sheet um right there this is where uh, people can put your information it's we found it's very helpful for um groups to coordinate the night before um, and i'll tell you why in a second uh, but um so if, if folks can just be like, hey, is everyone going out tomorrow? Or do you want to meet at 6.30, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, I'm not sharing my screen. Hopefully those links are in the chat. Yeah, you know? they're there. You, okay. Um, yep, they are in the chat. Why don't I just share my screen though? Um, just so we can all see it. So if you guys want to look together. So here's the, the volunteer contact sheet. Um, so names are in here. So you just look um, at who else is uh, doing the volunteering at that time and you can reach out. Um, here's the sign up sheet. Um, thanks to the folks who are, have, look and see we're, we're almost filled up already. Um, it does though at this point still look like we're a little bit lower than normal. Uh, what we like to do if we have, you know, so like this day, um, where Chris and her husband are going out and then Deborah and Kara are going out. If we have four people on a route, what we can do is walk the route differently. And so we do ask that every day that somebody walks the normal route, which is stopping at Ocean Gate, starting at Ocean Gateway and then going around and coming back to Ocean Gateway. But if you have a lot of volunteers, you could have someone start, say, at Memek and then do the route. And so you're walking two routes at the same time. Um, we do miss birds. Um, and I'll tell you, uh, gulls in Portland are know exactly the sound of a bird striking a building and come down to, to get a meal. And so if, if we're not there fairly quickly, uh, the birds may be gone. So it is helpful, if possible, to have people walk the, the route in multiple ways. So those are the um, two sign up things that are helpful to use. Yep. And so just to for everybody's sake um the first walk we always do start out with the group walk on the sixth um and then after that it's pairs of people two to four people sometimes more that go out um and yeah we try to get coverage at least two people every single day and and even though portland's a pretty safe area you know and some people are perfectly fine walking the route by themselves um it's usually nice just to have um, at least two people every day if we can get them yeah and a new um, thing that we're doing for this fall is something called the group leader. Um, this is just someone who is uh, responsible for reaching out to, uh, responsible for two things. It's not a big responsibility, but it's um, making sure that there's a, you're connecting with people the night before you go. So just send a text to the group to say, hey, we're so good. And then uh, make sure that the photos get sent in at the end of the day. That's all. Uh, it just helps to have someone in charge there. 
And then if for some reason you can't go on a certain day, you know, that's perfectly fine. We know things happen. Um, if you could just remove your name from the list too, because we also kind of keep track of just effort um, and this kind of thing helps us for um, when it comes time to um, actually use the data um, for various reasons. So yeah, so if you could remove your name, if you know you're not gonna go out, that's great. We don't judge. 6.30 still can be early. Yeah. I find, I'll tell you that it's, I feel great when I'm done. You know, you, you Jim a two mile how, walk in. Oh, sorry, Katie. Jim asked how long it usually takes. I would say an hour and a half. It's, yeah, if you don't find any birds, you can do it in about an hour. Um, it kind of depends on just how, how fast you walk and then depends once on how fast. Yeah, and then if you find if you start finding birds, it'll take longer just because you're photographing. You can like bike and run the walk too, as long as you're taking adequate time to like look, spe especially at the specific locations uh, for birds, and not just you know like biking by really quickly. Yeah, people have also done that, and that's quicker. Yeah, some people take longer. Some people just chit chat and uh, and stroll around too. You know, it's a nice uh, way to get your steps in. All right, any other questions? Uh, I thank everyone for joining. Yeah, Marsha asked a oh, question. Where is that? Uh, the group leader is. We've just made it the first yeah um, column in the sign up sheet so that whoever signs up in that first column is the designated group leader for that day. So it's self-determined. Forever, but just for the day. You're volunteering to be the group leader as well as to walk that day. So thanks again for everyone for coming. You know, this has been a really exciting project for us. We, we are making a lot of policy progress. Um, this is an area of environmental study that is undergoing a lot of, uh, you know, growth and, and change and movement in recent years, and it's really exciting to be a part of it. Um, but we can't do any of it without the, the data. Um, you know, the data that we've gathered, the hard evidence that we have from the streets of Portland and from around Maine has really, uh, has been everything to us in terms of um, making progress in Maine. So uh, we thank you all in advance. Um, I will be sending out some more information, I think next week um, to the folks here and to the other volunteers who didn't join. Um, and I hope to see everyone on the group walk. It's not required to go on the group walk, um, but it is a fun way to meet people and to, to do it all together. All right. Um, thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks, Katie and Chris. And we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Carolyn. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.